Okay, now I can really stretch my legs. <laughs> but if it goes on too long, you know, just tell me, and I can always uh, speed it up or cut it off. Um, what I had said originally is that uh, if you could save your questions until the end, but seeing we have an intimate, I would say rather small, select group of people, I wouldn't mind if you want to interrupt or ask a question just to make it more interesting. Are you okay with the music? Or do you want yeah, to? we probably need to switch this. What we're hearing now is uh, music from Igade. I did my original research among the Igade people of Nigeria. Yeah, thank you. And um, I did the research there, and as a result, I published some articles, and I also produced a CD of uh, traditional Igade music. And I'm going to start by just talking about what I knew before I came to the Virgin Islands, the fact that I had studied masquerading, and I uh, arrived as a virgin in Virgin Islands, that means I didn't know very much about uh, Virgin Island culture. Uh, but what I had explored, again, was the African masquerades. And uh, that's really where we're going to, to start. So while I was working among the Igade people, um, I came across various masquerades, but in particular I came across three types of masquerades which I'm using as a model, as an archetype to explore Caribbean masquerades. So the first of these is a bush masquerade and the bush masquerade is really my term or a term people use uh, just because it's covered with raffia of some kind or another and, and that constitutes the, the costume um, oh, just a bit of preamble here. I received, while, while I was here, when I arrived here, um, I had uh, received two grants from the Virgin Islands Humanities Council, and that enabled the research to begin with, and then the second grant enabled me to actually have the book published, uh, Old Time Masquerading in the the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, so yes, this is uh, on Onyun Wunyu, bush masquerade, dancing at the New Yam Harvest Festival, and it gives the appearance of hugeness because of this big costume. But you'll notice that this ram's main wrist shield is actually an instrument people use in war. It's a protective wrist shield. And in the other hand, he's got just a replica, a wooden uh, cutlass, but he has that rather threatening, I call it bush monster, uh, appearance. The next uh, slide is of an eager day stilt masquerade. And, um, oops, sorry, oops, didn't mean to do that. So where I was. Um, so the Igade they do have stilt masquerades, but the appearance of this masquerade with the woven body stocking um, costume, which different kinds of masquerades have, is not something you find in the Caribbean. And to be honest, the Igade people themselves were too deep into the hinterland. Uh, I don't think any or very few ever actually made that transatlantic crossing. But bush masquerade, um, stilt masquerade. And what's interesting about this one, you can't really see it too clearly. Most of my original photographs, 35 millimeters, printed as hard copy, and I had to scan them to get them, make them electronic. And I have clearer picture, but this masquerade here has actually got horns. Um, in this oh, yes. case, they're wooden horns, which is not typical of the um, the horned masquerades that appear in the Caribbean, which actually wear real horns, real cow horns in most cases. 
which are much less common in West Africa, although they are there. Um, so with the grants that I got from the Humanities Council, I originally uh, was able to publish this book, Old Time Masquerading, and some of you have it already, and it's certainly here in the library. Um, and so, when I arrived in the Virgin Islands, again, I say a, a virgin, I knew very little about uh, Caribbean culture, uh, I was having that background experience of African masquerades, I was very pleased to find out, oh, there is a masquerading tradition here. And it was really my professor, Ruth Beagles, who um, uh, enlightened me to that, remembering that when she was a child in Christianstead, uh, Christmas Day, and probably Boxing Day, she'd hear the jing 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 of the steel, and she'd look out the window and there would be uh, Lucifer with horns, or maybe the, the donkey prancing around, and she'd throw her coin. So that is what alerted me to the fact that there were masquerades here, and so that really uh, stimulated my interest, and that was what made me decide that I needed to do some to research on that. And so my research, well, I got information first-hand observations where I could, where they existed, certainly a literature review, and I will just mention uh, George Tyson and his uh, exploration, and he actually made available to me a lot of articles that were printed in the St. Thomas Tidende, the newspaper, back in those days, and of course they really reveal a lot. And then again, Mostly, I interviewed people, elders, experts, culture bearers, and I realize now how timely that um, research was because I interviewed at least the, all of these people and some more, and quite a few of these people have since passed on. They've joined the ancestors. So, you know, I'm happy that the book does include their memories and uh, well I could mention a few people but uh, on St. Croy, Eulalie Rivera, uh, a masquerade drummer Frank Charles, uh, Ali Paul, and some of you would know Ali Paul as a Mokojambi performer, uh, Stanley Jacobs going strong and many other people, and St. John Elroy and Elaine Sproul provided value, valuable information, and on St. Thomas, a lot of people, but including Alfred Lockhart, Geraldo Gertie, Gertrude Melchior, who was a founder member of the Gypsies, uh, William Richardson, who was from Anguilla, uh, uh, a Jambi performer, uh, interviewed him, of course he's passed on uh, now. And so in the acknowledgments of this book I say, within this book many voices are heard and my role is simply be to assemble the information in a coherent manner. Uh, so I assembled the information according to particular themes, identifying different mask types and their performance, the festival calendar when they perform, how the groups were organized and how they were financed. Um, and in publishing the original book, I found a lot of different questions were raised, like where did these masquerades come from? What do they represent? What are they? What do they mean? How do they function? So in pursuing that, I prepared a second book which was published by the University Press of Mississippi, which I was very happy about, and uh, attempted to answer some of those questions. Now the, the book is available either from the University Press of Mississippi or, on, or online. Um, Amazon. Uh, So I've looked at the terms Creole, 
Afro Creole, and also Neo African. Uh, they're useful terms. Uh, Creole, of course, in this context simply means a mixture, and the mixture is primarily of European and African because in the realm of masquerades, uh, the Amerindians they really didn't masquerade. And certainly they didn't have, for example, the horse masquerade or the bull masquerade because there were no horses or bulls here prior to colonization. Um, so I imagine the sliding scale between the European and the African poles and any particular masquerade could fall in a, a place on that sliding scale. And so some of them, such as, this is David and Goliath, or the King George Mamas uh, in St. Kitts, and the Platt Pole, which is a Maypole, those are closer to the European end. Uh, whereas, for example, the Mop of Jumbi, is closer to the African end. And the reason we can say that, and I quote Ali Paul, he used the term stilt dancers to describe the Moko Jumbi, as opposed to stilt walkers who appear in European circuses and, and other places. And as I moved on and did my research on the uh, Moko Jumbi and produced an article in African Arts, I looked really at the African precursors, the African stilt dancers. Um, but I will say before I move on, that although we might call something Afro-Creole or Creole, but we can also use Neo-African to describe the Moko Jumbi. And uh, but we must recognise that because the majority of population in the Virgin Islands are predominantly of African descent, but even when European influences have been incorporated, there's been an African aesthetic sensibility have been applied. And the quadrille is a good example of that. Quadrille, a French dance, a popular dance once upon a time. But of course it's been reinvested in the Virgin Islands and made more Africanized, if you like, or at least more Caribbeanized with the bright, lively costumes and the music sort of up-tempo uh, uh, music. And uh, one thing I do want to say, because we think of Madras, when we think of the quadrille, we think of the Madras costume. I've heard people say that, well, Madras, it's really uh, comes from uh, Guadeloupe and Martinique is not really a Virgin Islands thing. That's not true. I don't believe that. There are, are records going back in pre emancipation days, and Madras was at Christmas time when they got the Christmas gift ceremonies or Christmas gifts. Uh, Madras was very often included among the cloth that was uh, given to enslaved people. So we start off talking, I refer to the Raffia masquerade or the Bush masquerades. Well, here's a, a Raffia masquerade uh, in St. Croix. And uh, we, we have to say that the Raffia masquerades, they were called bears, shaggy bears, in, in both Barbados and the Virgin Islands. Um, they're pretty much obvious that we don't see them anymore. and I, wasn't able to find any photographs of the original shaggy bears. There might be some out there. Um, so what I did manage to, to get really don't do justice to the full-bodied raffia masquerades that I saw in Nigeria and elsewhere. This is one in St. John. Uh, in Barbados, the shaggy bear appeared in the annual Cropoba festival in each mill yard and he was dressing copious amounts of, uh, of raffia and uh, plus some red bows of red cloth or, or paper. And here in the Virgin Islands in the 1914 carnival, Elik the bear 
perform, but then later on coca beer became more popular. In fact, he used to travel between St. Croix and St. Thomas, and coca the bear appeared in the early 1950s carnival. Um, so the question arises, where do these masquerades come from? And the simple answer to that is, well, they come from Europe and they come from Africa. Uh, what formative influences exist? So before we say, well, they come from this place or that place, we have to do, rule out the idea of independent invention. concept of parallel evolution suggests that the same idea can emerge separately in different times and different places. Um, so we have to think of the, the pragmatic choice of costume materials. The peasants in the three areas that I've been looking at, West Africa, Western Europe, and the Eastern Caribbean, poverty, they, they were poor people. Uh, so that's common to all of them. So a convenience principle suggests that what is nearby can be used as a costume. What is nearby in these agricultural communities? Dried leaves. Either uh, sugar cane, banana or plantain dried leaves. So these costumes have been available and cheaply available and they serve as a disguise. Um, so when I say, well, you can find them in Europe, we can look at, for example, here's a looking through the world like a bezon, that is a broom. Uh, here's a straw masquerade in uh, Styria, in Austria. Um, other straw masquerades may not have been as big, but they were more plentiful. In fact, they appeared in a dozen or more people. Here's a straw boy in, uh, in Ireland, and they would come out at Christmas time, and they even appeared at weddings. They'd, uh, show up at somebody's wedding and the leader would dance with the bride and that was supposed to be uh, for good health and prosperity. And again in uh, UK, in England, uh, it's a straw bear in Whittlesea. And uh, in Germany, Czechoslovakia and England, these masquerades were called straw bears. Um, but generally we can say that the British masquerades were repressed over the thousands of years, but more recently the last few hundred years, and the straw bear was actually banned in 1909, shortly after this photograph was taken. Um, they were supposed to be a public nuisance. But the good news is that they were revived in 1979, and uh, since that time they appear regularly on Straw Bear Tuesday. Straw Bear Tuesday is the day after Plough Monday, mm -hmm. which is the first Monday after Twelfth Night. Um, so I can also add that peasants in Denmark in the medieval times had a vibrant mumming culture, and although the horned Yulebuck was outlawed in 1688, they did continue to have straw effigies. So who knows, maybe this familiarity might have encouraged the fact that the straw bear appeared in the Danish West Indies. Mostly, as I say, we find them in the Danish West Indies and in Barbados. Okay, turning to Africa, uh, a kitty masquerade, a Yoruba a straw masquerade, and what is wonderful about this one, or this particular photograph, is you get the feeling of movement. You can feel that these are, are dancing, masquerades, still somewhat monstrous, they could frighten, they could frighten people, especially children. Um, and more often we tend to find, I've looked particularly at the Upper Guinea region, oops, pressing around now, here we are, how do I get that full screen, any idea? Mm -hmm. Do I have to start from the beginning? fingers and thumbs. There you go. 
uh, I looked particularly at the Upper Guinea region and found it very interesting because a lot of the early settlements <coughs> to the Eastern Caribbean or the Caribbean generally did come from, just because Senegal is so near to Europe, first place you reach when you leave Europe if you're in a, a slave ship is, is Senegal or Gambia. It's over. As a result, many of the early migrants, not all of them, uh, came from that Upper Guinea region, and this is uh, Kampo, uh, a masquerade, and he represents, when he dances, he's, he has a pole, and this gentleman here is, is propping the pole up, because it would slide otherwise, but leaning on the pole, he whirls around, he does a whirling dance, and that simulates whirlwinds, and that whirling dance of Kampo is thought to combat witchcraft and other malicious forces. Um, again, the Mandinka Kankaran masquerade and, and notice that he's holding a cutlass here. Um, the Kankaran masquerade widespread among the Mandinka documented in 1732 on the banks of the Gambia river. It also, as well as dancing and entertaining, it does serve as an instrument of social control, often carrying either a machete or a whip. What's interesting here is that this particular raffia is made from the shredded red bark of a tree known as the Farah tree, which is reckoned to be a tree of peace. People would choose to plant it in their compound uh, as a way of excuse me, combating wickedness. And uh, a lot of these masquerades appear at initiations, male initiations, and uh, but they would also be brought out from time to time just to cleanse the community. Um, when the bark of the farrow tree became scarce, it was still performed in, in urban areas uh, in the Senegambia region, they started to use uh, manufactured materials. They'd shred a rice sack and use that, uh, which is sort of interesting because it does uh, line up with uh, the sensei masquerades which perform in Dominica, which also use a variety of materials for their costumes and not always vegetal fiber. They also shred sacks and use that as a costume. Now, just out of interest, the name Sensei uh, takes its name from a particular chicken. I don't know ever, whether you've ever heard of the uh, Sensei chicken. It's a very fluffy, call it frizzled, frizzled fowl. And this chicken was by folklore thought to be able to scratch up evil magic buried against the owner. So in Dominica, again, according to folklore, the bird and by association the sensei masquerade are historically linked with obia finding and duppy catching. Duppy, of course, is another name for jumbi. Um, and again, they tended to use frayed rope, uh, paper, even plastic sacks for their costumes, which links back up with the Kankaran masquerade. This one, you might note, also has horns. Um, as far as the uh, Mokojumbi goes, here's an old picture around 1900, Danish era, and I would say this particular uh, Mokojumbi looks very much like the Mock Ghost, which is what the name implies. Um, Mokojumbi was first documented in St. Vincent, as far as I know, in 1791, and also according to the records and literature, the costume didn't change very much from 1870 to 1940, consisting male performers wearing female clothing. And I would suggest that this is another example of practical expediency talk about raffia, or what could be easier than going to uh, your wife or your mother or your sister's closet and picking out a, a dress uh, for a male performer and using that as a disguise, as a costume. You don't really have to spend any money on it. And this was common enough, and uh, 
in the Virgin Island Voices collection uh, of interviews uh, recorded by Mary Jane Soul and available in the Library of Congress American Folk Life Center's collection. Uh, she interviewed Amos Frett in St. Thomas in 1979 and he remembered masquerading in Tutu back in the Danish era, eh, sorry, the Danish era, and he states, in quotes, we had mass out here in the country. Men used to wear woman frock and thing. We went to Tutu. I think it was Whit Monday. We would mass all about. I was one. I had a frock on, too. We had string music, guitar, lute, wiro, and ass pipe. So the idea of using a woman for a man, using a woman's dress as a costume, uh, was uh, common enough. The well-known Moko Jambi, Magnus, here he is in the field, he thought it was Lionel Roberts Stadium. Um, but after the Depression and World War II, money was more available, so entertainers like Magnus started to design their own costumes and his trademark triangular hat uh, was one part of the costume he, de he designed. And here I'm just quoting Leona Watson from St. Croix, a Harry Show singer. She says, a Mokko Jambi represents a supernatural scarecrow, an effigy that ridicules, ridicules and scares away ghosts. This is Gerard Last James. He, I remember him as a lieutenant governor one time. Um, here is in the Emancipation Day Parade, 1995, and he's following a Pitchy Patchy costume, we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, worn by Amy Gill. And as time went by, Mokka Jambi performers such as Willard John and Lewis James, they started to choose uh, African cloth, Kenti cloth and other cloth, uh, to make their designs more African looking. Um, he commonly will carry, the Louis James will commonly carry an African fly whisk, but otherwise, and I interviewed him of course, he'd like to have his costume represent local culture. Tall pointed hat made of goat skin, decorated with ginger thomas or hibiscus flowers, as well as peacock feathers. And it, like so many masquerades, he sold little mirrors into his costumes. That was somewhat common. And also he'd wear jumbi beads, little red and black beads, jumbi beads, which is traditionally supposed to ward off um, jumbis or witchcraft or bad things. And then in my African Arts article, I started to look at different stilt masquerades uh, in West Africa. Um, and this particular masquerade, Ikanike, Ikanike masquerade of the Ahobo, which were an, an Igbo people. And uh, this particular masquerade, when you see the photograph, you see the shadow of his stilts. You realize he's in fact left the ground, he's jumping. And for the Ahobo, the stilts place the performances near to the spirits of the air as possible, uh, edu enu, spirits of the air, and for these ikanike dancers, they're not only entertaining the mortal audience, but also performing for these spirits which exist in the air. But as a result of my research, I felt that these, uh, sorry, these Igbo uh, still masquerades were not really that similar to um, what we know as a Moko Jambi. Instead, the Upper Guinea stilt masquerades, such as these Dan uh, stilts, seem to be more like the Moko Jambi as we know them. And stilt masquerades appear among the, the many Mande people who live in this Upper Guinea region, including the Dan and, and others. Uh, their stilt masquerades. Um, tend to look more like what we recognize today as Mokajambis. Note the little 
raffia skirts that's common to their uh, masquerades and I, I think Dulce you showed me a postcard once of a masquerade uh, from, uh, it was from Gambia or one of those places um, Lublin Michael Hewitt talks about the Lublin masquerade and he said it originated in the Kono area of Guinea and spread to the Toma and other Mandate people on the Liberian border. And these masquerades, as recorded, uh, as I read about them, uh, really they tend to serve to rid an area of witchcraft. That uh, sounds familiar. Uh, they would attempt to trample the witchcraft underfoot. Uh, they would dance and at the same time they'd be trampling spells and other things. So before we leave uh, the Moko Jumbi, uh, and come out as well as I would like, these, these were brilliant blue costumes uh, that I photographed in 1997. And I just point this out, that we talk about Afro-Creole masquerades, in other words, a Caribbean version of African masquerades. And these mystical Moko Jumbis, uh, Win John, who is a brother to Willard John, he was the originator of the mystical Moko Jambi True. Sorry they didn't come out as blue as I'm seeing them on the screen in front of me. But they were, they were beautiful. Um, okay, moving off of uh, Moko Jambis and on to animal disguises. Uh, here's a bull uh, in Frederickstead in 1905. Historic photograph, I mean, unique very lucky to have such a remnant, such a, a record of uh, bull masquerade. Now, the bull masquerade existed in a lot of different islands. Uh, Red Bull in St. Kitts and Nevis. In Jamaica, the cow head Junkanoo. Uh, sorry, Junkanoo in Jamaica. And then the Junkanoo in the Bahamas. In Antigua, the John Bull in the Virgin Islands of Wild Bull, and more recently, uh, the Jam Bull, which was revitalized, I'll talk about that. So, masquerades such as the Raffia Bear, the Bull, and the Moko Jumbi, they would entertain primarily, prior to Carnival, during Christmas, and other public holidays, Easter, Whit Monday, but they also use as a tool for parental discipline. If you don't behave to a child, if you don't behave yourself, after 16 will come. You keep wet in your bed, then at Christmas time, after 16 is going to be chasing you, running you, they say. After 16 is going to run you. <laughs> and generally, the bull seems to have been the father of uh, Caribbean masquerades. It was recorded in Jamaica as early as 1688. This is a jam bull masquerade performing in St. Thomas in 2001. Now that year, 2001, we had a symposium, that is UVI, sponsored a symposium by the Arts, Ca Arts Council of the African Studies Association, the CASA, I won't keep repeating the, the long title. The CASA Symposium was held at Frenchman's Reef, and but on the Friday before the adult parade, they had a performance of a play called The Killing of Arthur Sixteen, written by Edgar Lake. Some of you would know him. And uh, so that was good. That was at the Reichold Center. Then the very next day, in the adult parade, then George Pope Flat Farrell, and also Glenn Pierre, uh, wore their bull costumes and performed uh, on Main Street. And then they performed again uh, the following year, and for a few years they appeared in the, the adult parade, and of course it's a traditional mm -hmm. drum mm -hmm. ensemble yeah. for a masquerade, a bass drum, a snare drum, etc. Um, I went to Antigua looking for John Bulls, I didn't know that lucky, but I don't want to go into the whole story, but if you remember 2001, what do we call it? The 
thought there was going to be all the computers were going to... Uh, Y2K. Huh? Y2K. The millennium change. The millennium. Yeah, millennium Y2K. Yeah. Yeah. So, one was something else. I didn't want to stay out of the Virgin mm -hmm. Islands into 2001, so I left mm -hmm. there shortly after Christmas Day. I didn't want to stay there too, until New Year's Day. Mm -hmm. And people were saying, oh, that's when you're going to see the John Paul. Oh. Uh, I, I left there because of this uh, a scare, which never proved to be uh, unfounded. But I did uh, photograph this was performing for tourists. A lot of masquerades these days perform for tourists. This was at Sandals uh, Hotel Resort. And it's sort of a replica of a John Bull, but it's not bad. It's pretty good. I mean, generally, just while I'm talking, I will say that over the years, the plastic masks, uh, they're not as well designed as the, the old um, uh, widescreen masks of the old days. But in uh, Antigua, the John Bull was a strong part of the tradition. It used to. Uh, be associated with traditional fraternities of butchers, of farmers, of cattlemen, of road builders, of bars captains, of dock operators, stevedores, machine workers. They, they would play in that era, the 40s and 50s. They played a political role, uh, uh, hooking up with uh, the unions. These are the sensei bulls in Dominica. Uh, now, not wearing real horns as the previous masquerades were wearing, but nevertheless quite imposing with their uh, costumes made of burlap, cut sections of burlap, and they appear in goat skin drum parades, and forgive my pronunciation, La Pure Cabrit, in various towns in Dominica. And Again, they look quite intimidating, and what makes them more so is that they would wear apparently wooden clogs with metal cleats, and later Coca-Cola cats. So when they would parade down the street, they would make quite a clatter. Okay, moving to West Africa, horned masks. This is the Ajumba masquerade of the Jola in Senegal. And... Uh, Again, you tend to find them in this Upper Guinea region, the Ciola, the Mendinka, even the Ibo had uh, bullhorn masquerades, and all of these groups, the Ciola, the Mendinka, and Ibo, were all transported to the Caribbean in quite uh, large numbers. But they didn't call these masquerades bulls, they just called them, in this case, a jumba. Um, and they were associated particularly with age grade ceremonies, uh, male initiations. And at that time, uh, the fathers, they would sacrifice cattle to celebrate the in initiation, also provide food for these celebrations. And after the, uh, I would say the graduates came, excuse me, out of the bush school, they go into the sacred forest and initiation school. And when they came out of the forest, the initiates, the graduates, would all be wearing these horned headdresses, symbolizing their passes to uh, manhood. Um, this Jumba mask was collected in 1886. It's in the Berlin Museum. What's interesting about, well, the helmet itself is made of uh, palm fronds, but it's decorated with cowrie shells, which are quite clear, but also all of these little red beads, abras, which are jumbi beads. And the term ajumba, and the word jumbi, you can hear the similarity. Uh, and so there's a connection there. Although we have to recognize that that term Jumbi, and here I'm quoting Gerhard Siebert, among others, uh, they often, it has been looked to the Congo, Kimbundu, uh, and Kikongo, because they have words like Njambi and Zumbi. 
and they, the suggestion is that the zombie, the word zombie, but also zumbi might also uh, come from that. But finding a dual provenance is not unusual uh, dealing with these uh, African terms. This is the Red Spear Masquerade. You can't see the horns as well as I would like. Uh, Red Spear Masquerade of the Mendinka. Um, these days, uh, this one is actually red flannel, flannel decorated with cowrie shells. And they would also wear raffia costume. But these days, whereas in the past they wore the same dried leaf raffia, these days they still perform. They wear green leaves. And Peter Mark, who wrote a book called The Wild Bull and the Sacred Forest, he talks about the Mandinka Red Spear, he says in quotes, it contains a symbolic reference to the slave trade because slaves would be purchased or ransomed using cattle as currency. And showing the importance of cattle to the Jola, here we see a funeral bear, I'm not sure I'm saying that right, uh, a funeral bear which would carry the corpse to the grave and as a sign of respect you can see it's decorated with these bull horns. Now again we see some similarities because these cattle horns were thought to be able to find during the funeral procession were thought to be able to find any individuals who may have contributed to the death of whoever. Um, generally in West Africa, they always take death. It's not something natural. Somebody caused it. Who caused it? Well, the coffin or the bear would lead the funeral procession, possibly to individuals who may have contributed in some way to the, to the death. Um, and we find a similarity here. I'm looking at Oldendorf, the missionary, CGA Olden, Moravian missionary, CGA Oldendorf. He talks about in the Eastern Caribbean that often a coffin going to the cemetery can lead pallbearers to persons with whom the deceased may have had unresolved issues. So <coughs> you see a similarity right there. Then moving much further south, this is an Njima uh, bullhorn masquerade of the Ebo. This is an Ebo masquerade, and there's quite a few that I came across. Um, Eddie Benter, a uh, colleague, has done research on uh, these masquerades uh, among the Ebo, and, and so this is an example uh, of one. Um, this one was actually again performing during a burial ceremony. Masquerades and funerals coincide a lot in West Africa. Um, there's quite a lot of information about that, but I'm going to keep moving on. Um, okay, bullhorns in West Africa, bullhorns in England. And this is the Tetri Bull. What record we have of the Tetri Bull in the West Country, Gloucestershire. Um, animal masquerades include, in Europe, animal masquerades include the horned Yulba, of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, and also the Christmas Bull of England and Scotland. But because of repression, the British Bull has largely died out by the 20th century, but we were fortunate, or we say it's fortunate, one side survived long enough to be photographed, but actually disappeared. Uh, it, the costume was created at the beginning of the 1800s. It last performed in the 1930s, and the mask disappeared after it was photographed in 1975. And just verbally, I was told that Granny was ashamed of it. She felt it was shown people to be primitive or superstitious, and she burnt it. Apparently, I don't know how true that is. Um, but in their prime, the Christmas balls of Dorset and Wiltshire, Wiltshire roam the streets at Christmas and were given, in quotes, given the freedom of every house and allowed to penetrate in, into any room. 
And here again is that uh, social control nature of some of these early masquerades. Then, no longer a bull, he's a goat. Tapanipuki goat in Finland. And we can see by the posture of this particular costume, they can look quite threatening. Um, and there's quite a number of rec records of the Yule Buck in Norway, uh, how they used to buck people, and the first one, the first lady that each goat, goat bucked was supposed to become his wife. Uh, here in 1919 is a Yule Buck and a Yule get, a male and a female, in Sweden. And they would visit farms uh, around New Year, um, bringing good luck and peace, health and strength. And it was a form of reciprocal barter because they would expect gifts. Uh, most of these gifts were simple things, cake, you know, same masquerades here, Johnny Cake and... Uh, drinks, beer, beer, vodka, uh, and those gifts were necessary to guarantee the realization of the wish congratulation. And I'm quoting it, it was also believed that if some of the goats were not offered anything, they would take away the luck of the household. You, know, you can see how this is like a trick or treat situation. Um, Norway banned the Yule Buck in Sweden. Oh, New Norway in 1687. Norway banned Yule Bucks, and Sweden soon followed. While Denmark had already forbidden them in 1668. So, although the Yule Buck disappeared from Danish soil, it did manage to survive in Norway and Sweden. Um, but one result, maybe, of the Danish ban is that there were no goat masquerades ever appeared in the Danish West Indies. We saw bulls, but we didn't see goats. So, just pursuing this topic a little further, um, we can say that, say that most of the animal disguises that we've seen until this point, generally they fall into what we might call dressing down. Uh, they're not dressed up, they're looking ragged and, uh, and disreputable. Um, and we can say that such animal disguises, they did not aim at naturalistic portrayals. Although the raffia bear was shaggy, it didn't represent, didn't simulate fur. And many masquerades simply were anonymous and they didn't provide naturalistic renditions of anything. And generally, the intent was to astound audiences. An abstraction deriving from African aesthetic sensibilities prevailed. Unlike European classical art, which is aimed at realism or naturalism, mostly we find that uh, in, in Africa, such depictions tend to represent a more surreal world of the spirits and are expected to be in abstract expressionist Wassily Kandinsky's terms he described his art as a mysterious expression of the mysterious and I feel that applies to uh, these masquerades as well but the literati in the Virgin Islands they saw these sackcloth and raffia costumes and, something poor and paltry and complained about it in the Tidende, the newspaper, talking about these degenerated costumes and quotes, what we do reprehend is the disporting on the streets of ragged, unsuitably swathed individuals, unacceptable to both sight and taste. Um, well, I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions about that statement, but just moving on to this idea of abstract representation, then this is a pity patty, also known as Sensei, it was in Antigua, uh, is also an abstract interpretation. In 1797, a Jamaican report described masquerade costumes hung with shreds of various 
colored, colored cloth, sorry, hung with shreds of various colored cloth dangling like a loose shag. And again, informants in the Virgin Islands talk about the pitchy patchy costumes made out of flower bags with colorful cloth stuck on. Now the pitchy patchy is supposed to be very athletic. They would display turns, cartwheels, and large movements in circular patterns to show off the feathery costume. Here is a pitchy patchy in Frederickstead. I think I'll try and speed it up a bit. Hopefully not bored. Um, this is a pitchy patchy in Frederickstead. Now Margaret Dean Smith proposes that the pitchy patchy cross costume evolved from the earlier shaggy vegetal costume because people were better off. But she was not talking about the Caribbean masquerade, she was also actually referring to British mamas, British masquerades, because we have to recognize the similarity in costume between the British mamas masquerade and those of, of Pitchy Patchy. These are actually the Marshfield paper boys. Their costumes are not even cloth. They're made up of torn colored paper. And they still perform, this was what, 1986? They still perform. Um, okay, switching now to clowns. We can recognize that after the depression, and, and the World War, money was more available and people started to design costumes, uh, make special costumes rather than just incorporating uh, stuff that was readily at hand. And sackcloth, people used to rinse out the sackcloth and turn them into costumes. Um, Carnival clowns, I feel, uh, represent authentic masquerades primarily because they're totally in disguise. They wear masks, they even wear white gloves to cover, cover their hands. And in this particular one, we can see they've used, these are the spools, the large reels of thread, and the spools have been turned into horns. Um, Carnival clowns, uh, represent a unique new world genre which bear little resemblance to British or European clowns. These are purely Afro-Creole masquerades and they, they have a long tradition. Uh, 1903, the Tidendi reports on Easter Monday in Charlotte and Malia in which a fine cavalcade of maskers dressed as Clowns included a fine cavalcade of maskers dressed as clowns. Uh, I just recognize that Miles Raymond uh, took this picture. He took pictures of the, the carnival parades in the 1960s and I've used some of his pictures. Uh, well, nowadays we recognize clowns as wearing these baggy costumes that have jingle bells, but still masks, still wearing gloves. Now, the clown genre was reinvigorated in the Virgin Islands during the 1950s during visits of these pan bands, the steel bands, Hell's Gate, Brute Force from Antigua, uh, Casablanca from St. Kitts, and they used to bring clowns with them. And the, these clowns became the prototype of the clowns that developed in the Virgin Islands. Now, as you know, clowns are supposed to be very lively and they still perform today, particularly in a troupe called the Tropical Masqueraders. I'm, I'm beginning to wind down at this point, but we're going to do a switch at this point because mostly I've been talking about uh, the Caribbean as being recipients of ideas from the old world, either Europe or Africa. But in reality, the Caribbean was also contributing uh, creolisms or creole-style masquerades, which were then transported back 
across the Atlantic and took root in the west coast of Africa. And these particular masquerades uh, were taken in Ghana. And again, we're seeing paper mache, a paper mache mask and wire screen masks. And in my book, I have a section called the Diaspora in Reverse, which looks at this return of Creole style masquerades to the uh, west coast of Africa. And uh, they're known there as either Kaka. Kaka Batofu, or in this case, Kaka Matobi, this is in their kraal in 1974. And we can recognize how much they are or resemble Creole masquerades from the Caribbean. Um, who carried these ideas there? Itinerant traders, to an extent, but largely by soldiers. Um, that is, West Indian colonial regiments. They were regiments. Uh, British regiments in the West Indies, and they were, in this case, they, they were based in Ghana to combat the Ashanti Wars, but also the Jamaican Maroons, who were uh, uh, exported uh, back to Sierra Leone, Freetown. And in Freetown, the, the Creole people, who tend to be, uh, uh, they move around a lot, they're sailors, uh, they helped spread these ideas around the west coast of Africa. And these are uh, relatively recent, or they still perform, as I know today. Okay, we're going to look at the hobby horse, or the donkey, uh, quickly. Uh, the hobby horse was a form of animal disguise. It's popular in medieval, uh, in this case, Britain. And it was designed, as you can see, to represent this as one performer who's wearing the costume, and it's meant to represent both the horse and the rider. And it was popular in entertainment, resisted by the churches. 1583, Philip Stubbs decried, in quotes, the hobby horses and other monsters which defiled the church and churchyard as part of the Lord of Misrule processions. Here's a, a horse disguise in Kamala in Finland. Again, we see the typical horse being worn. Excuse me. Uh, but this kind of horse appeared in Spanish America, but also in the Eastern Caribbean, in Barbados, Trinidad, and the Virgin Islands. In the Spanish Caribbean, it was given the name Barroquit, little donkey, and uh, the, had a light work, lightweight frame made of which work wire and other light material. Here is Amy Gill's um, having the donkey mask perform in Frederickstead. Um, Usually, Rivera had a lot to say about the donkey. It was something rude. They used to misbehave. There were two donkeys, a male and a female, <coughs> Blue Gong and Diana. And they would have, give comical renditions uh, leading up to romantic interlude, interludes, giving way to a humorous sexual courtship. Um, Okay, we switch now to, we're talking about more realistic. Mostly we've been looking at disguises all the way through. Until this point, we're going to realize that uh, some realism started to, was part of masquerade. And here is no longer abstract or stylized renditions. Instead, we're starting to see personal enhancement. People are not disguised. They want to be uh, seen in this grand form, dressed up, not dressed down. And uh, here I've got a quote again from the Tidende talking about an Easter Monday parade of, in quotes, young gentlemen 
who assuming the characters of celebrated men wore masks the very similitude of the personages they represented and that parade included a lot of different folk but kings and emperors, William the First, Napoleon Bonaparte, political leaders, George Washington, Otto von Bismarck, Middle Eastern rulers, Arabi Pasha and the Sultan, even the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates and noted French author Victor Hugo. It also included, and we're getting very near the end now, it also included the likeness of a of the Zulu chief, set a whale, who was a real person, of course it was somebody uh, masquerading or representing him in the parade. And I'm suggesting that having a, a Zulu chief in the parade would have uh, struck a responsive chord among the spectators, of course, most of whom have this African heritage. And set a whale, he fought the British and beat them. Although nowadays we think of Shaka Zulu, um, in his own time, Setuweo was highly acclaimed. In 1879, with 10,000 warriors, he inflicted a crushing defeat on the British in Isandalawana in Zululand. And following that, in 1882, he sailed to England to receive an audience with Queen Victoria and he was roundly hailed as a hero. And then again, we said in 1883, an impersonator appeared in the Eastern Monday Parade, and I'm suggesting this might have been the forerunner of the Zulus, who later came to perform, commonly perform at Christmas, and then later in the early carnivals. Um, Whip Monday was known for horse racing and masquerading. But in 1893, the Titende reported from four o'clock in the afternoon, a contingent of masqueraders kept the streets lively. Fortunately, the pugilistic tendencies of these wild Indians and Zulus, wild Indians and Zulus, affected none but the men themselves. Now this re record of Zulus in uh, 1893 predates the mention of Zulus in Mardi Gras who uh, are, are somewhat better known but they didn't actually perform in the Mardi Gras well the first Zulu social aid club was formed in 1909 and they didn't appear in the carnival parade until seven years later so I think there's an interesting point of history there, that possibly the Zulus, as a part of Carnival, uh, may have been originated here in St. Thomas. These are the Zulus in the 1914 St. Thomas Carnival. As you know, there was a Carnival in 1912 and 1914. Um, and the Zulus even survived into the 1950s, but they fell into a slump mostly because of their caricatured appearance. People said that their white loincloth looked like diapers. So they, people didn't take them very seriously. But then, lo and behold, they died out. But lo and behold, in 2002, uh, Charles Matthew, he decided that he would start a troop and started off just a few in number uh, called King Shaka of the Zulu Nation. And Charles Matthew is a bodybuilder, that's him there. Um, and so he gathered people around him and he tried to represent the Zulu, real Zulu warrior costume as authentically as he could. And of course, since that time, the Shaka Zulu Nation troop has grown in number, there's probably about two dozen or so and uh, they normally dance the CDs of African drum music. Now I will say that the carnivals as we know them in recent years, they normally end with the Indians. The Indians are the last troop uh, coming up. And I also am going to end this presentation with the Indians.
Um, they used to be called the wild Indians. Wild Indians. They jumped around and danced, and danced aggressively, whooping and shaking their braids. And uh, when the carnival was revived in 1952, they drew upon established masquerades for their participants. For example, Magnus, the still the Mopa Jumbo, Coca the Bear, Black Pole, the Indians, the Zulus, the Clowns, and Big Heads, David and Goliath, and the Down South troupe. Um, and then in 1953, Mother Hubbard, Bluebells, Old Fashioned Pantalettes, these were all women's troops, and an entry called Old Fashioned Masquerade. So, in the 1952 carnival, the Indians were attributed to David Hines and the Zulus to Eric Christopher. Uh, and then, as we know, in due course, steel bands, majorettes, and other new troops were formed. Um, Indian troop in 1996. The Indians are best known for their dramas, uh, or stereotypically known for their dramas. Um, in the old days, each masquerade had its own drum rhythm. And I was lucky enough to record Frank Charles, since deceased. He used to play uh, drums for Marshall, the Moko Jumbi. So I actually have a recording of the Moko Jumbi rhythm. Um, the Indian rhythms, uh, they haven't changed. They still have this fast, distinctive rhythm. And once they start beating their drums, they don't stop. They'll keep going all through the parade until they reach the stadium and finally wind up. Um, Philip Reimer boasted that the bass drum of the St. Thomas Indians was so loud you could hear, the, hear it all over Mapperley. Uh, Dr. C. Warren Smith joined the leadership of the Indians with Philip Reimer and was the traditional parade chief for decades. Two more slides. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, Philip Reimer, he was uh, with his wife, uh, Francis Abbott Reimer, they headed the, he was an uh, Indian since he was a young man in the 1920s, and then he headed the Indian uh, with his wife from about 1953 until he was very old, he's deceased now. Um, and he was well into his 90s when he appeared in the golden anniversary of the carnival in 2002. 50 years, and here he's riding his last parade in a, in a wheelchair. God bless his soul. Now my last slide is just really a commentary that we've talked about masquerades and we've looked at masquerades, but you hardly see masquerades in carnival anymore. Some people are reviving masquerades, uh, but many of them appear for, uh, for hotels. Um, rather than the old time Christmas festivals. Instead, what we tend to see are performers who I describe as promenaders. A masquerade disguises. A promenader doesn't disguise. They want you to see them. They even want you to know who they are. And, and what do we see in the modern promenaders? Well, mostly they wear skimpy costumes, uh, naked arms and legs, uh, this unencumbered flesh aspect uh, is equated to glitz and glamour and what we see mostly these days large troops wearing elaborate helmet, helmets with face makeup and body paint and often wearing tight, <coughs> tight spandex costumes and whereas in the old days masquerade had his own drum rhythm you, don't, you hardly hear drums anymore you, you hear drums for the Indians and you don't hear them too much. Nothing is permanent. Things go around and come around. But nowadays we technically see these sexy, sexually explicit dancers uh, uh, of these large troops with uh, music, uh, amplified music, amplified bands on trucks providing the music. So ladies and gentlemen, happy to have uh, made this presentation to you and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you. Thank you.
Any questions, discussion? It's been a long presentation. I do appreciate you staying uh, to the end. I have a question about the... You're saying that there was a transition to this to type of costume um, maybe in the 90s or late 90s, and you showed examples of the, the different traditional costumes, but was everybody in the parade at the beginning in those traditional costumes? Or, no. Or were there... Uh, um, Really, we have to look at the 1952 uh, revitalization of the carnival and on through the 50s. And I've said that there were many old time masquerades, but there were also new troops being formed. Uh, Gertrude Melchior and her compatriots, they formed the gypsies. And so a lot of the troops are still performed today, the troops, such as the gypsies, um, started back in the 50s. So you started to see steel bands, you started to see majorettes, you started to see troops who were probably more likely enhanced their appearance than disguised their appearance. Give or take, I mean, there's it, no hard and fast rule. I've got photographs of people, a clown or a jester, a jester is another troop, and the disguise, but the disguise is purely face paint. You wouldn't recognize necessarily who they are. Uh, they're well painted up. Um, well, they're still a masquerading in a sense, but it's been a slow transition. But the old time masquerades were mostly associated with Christmas, New Year, and other other holidays. And carnival is, is, is different. Is, is that true for St. Croix as well, where their carnival is based on Christmas? Or was theirs more no, traditional? Thank, thank you for that. No, that is, that's a good point, that uh, they've continued to have their uh, carnivals as a Christmas or New Year entertainment. And that's been more or less continuous. Um, as far as who appears in the carnival, it's, it's really more the same. Although they, they do have these uh, traditional masquerades uh, so-called traditional masquerades uh, appearing in the carnival. I'm trying to remember the names of uh, some of the people I interviewed who, who do perform in those masquerades. Yeah. You're going to have to shout. I'm a bit hard to hear. Okay. Uh, the mention of St. Croix, uh, I find that festival in St. Croix tends to be far more traditional us here and it could be because of people like Will or John that keep you know guardians of culture yeah, keep God bless it going us. you know and whereas with those moco jumpies they are fully covered there is no body part skin ever showing and yeah. I remember Willer telling me that's how it's supposed to be and the other thing is one of the photos back sometime it's when it um it said Danish West Indies, and I saw the arches. It didn't identify the island. I didn't want to interrupt you. And I'm wondering, was it St. Croix or St. Yeah, Thomas? It, well, if you're Do talking you about the, the Moko Jambi, it said Danish West Indies. Right. Uh, it was. It was Christian state. It, yeah, it looked like Christian state. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, and it was pre-transfer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's one or two pictures of uh, Moko Jambi's pre-transfer. And thinking about it, I think most of them are on are on Saint Croix. But the thing about that photo, which is why I was asking, it still had that wire screen mask. Oh yeah. Which in the last that's it, thank you so much. Which in the last parade in St. Thomas, there were clowns, but I did not see one wire screen mask this time, Dr. Nichols. It's like they've disappeared after a hundred years. Yeah. It's and I'm sure they're still in St. Croix because of Willard. Um, Not only Willard, there are, there are other people, I'm other trying to remember their names. Yeah. Asta Williams, I think uh, she Asta did. Williams, thank right. you. Yeah. Because I had visited her and she actually had a, a little, I guess a children's class, where they would make wire screen Good. masks. Good. Yeah, I interviewed people who used to make uh, the wire screen masks. It was, it was quite a technical process. They would have a mold and then mold the mask on the wire screen onto the, the, the mold. Um, yes, indeed. Am I right? Is that a wire screen mask? 
I'm pretty sure. I mean, some can be hard to tell sometimes because in those early eras, they also used to buy masks. They had like mail order. Well, I knew that came up from Trinidad in cases because I had written, you know, like 144, and we're talking exactly around that time. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know where they came in from Trinidad, Europe. Yeah, they came in from Europe because uh, in Venice and other places, uh, ah, people have been wearing uh, similar masks for, for a long time. Um, yeah. Well, thank uh, you. But but the wire was not painted. Is that what you're saying? That they arrived just they the wire played, mask and then played what they? I think they were white actually. So and they, and they were not painted up. Like if you go to if you compare those of Belize or Montserrat or say kids, they're all painted differently. Yeah. Because some of them. Which ones I have there? They are like a, a bright pink, like a, a jelly bean pink. <laughs> yeah. So they're all different, but they did come in empty. They were molded though, so you just painted them up. And sometimes they cut holes. Sometimes they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, interesting. You, you obviously know quite a lot about the subject, and good for you. Um, yeah, there has been that transition, and. I mean, I love authenticity. If people are able to revitalize the history and create authentic um, replicas of the old masquerades, and I'm so happy. Um, all the time, we tend to see lip service uh, paid to this or that, but the authentic uh, renditions are not so many. A couple of points I'd like to make. One that might refer to Bambula. I'm so happy to see Bambula dancers. But compared to the original Bambula uh, dancers, they're really a, a very pale replica. Because the Bambula, and I think the best example of it now is in Bomba in Puerto Rico. Um, the original Bambula was really a, uh, it featured a conversation between a drummer and a dancer dancer would make certain movements and the drummer would attempt to pick up those movements with the drum and they would have this sort of conversation. Also the original bamboo the dancers were ma they were male and female. I mean it got to be, and I've written a whole article about this, um, it got to be that eventually it became pretty much female and it was very much stamped, I mean, uh, stamped down. Uh, the, the gombe and the bamboo, they, they were very much harassed by the Tidende, Tidende and other press, and they were more or less uh, wiped out. So I'm very pleased they can make the quadrille uh, European dance, the national dance of the Virgin Islands, but I'm so happy to see Bambula. But I wish they would do their research and, and try and create a more authentic Bambula. The other thing, and I, I say this in the book, what attracted me to masquerading in the very beginning was I felt it was a combination of different arts. I call it whole theatre. It would combine music, it would combine uh, visual arts in the masks and so forth, and dance, of course, and, and drama. All of those things were uh, manifested in, in masquerading, and that's really what attracted me to it. And as I visited and did my research among the Igade people, um, that's where I really saw this, what I'm calling whole theater. And I did bring a DVD with me because they're still performing these masquerades. And to see a masquerader dancing in that West African context, to me is a transcendent and a very uplifting experience. And God bless Pope Farrell who performed the bull and, and other masqueraders, but uh, there's a lot missing in terms of dance. There's a lot missing, and to see that uh, visual representation, I say in African arts, you see the masks. You can buy CDs of African music, but to get the real experience, you have to see the masquerader dancing to the to the music. And so, for me, authenticity is is really a key. I haven't given up. You know. <laughs> Good question and good observation. Thank you for that. Can, can you speak a little bit about, in, in your presentation, you said that uh, whether it was in England or in Denmark, that some of the traditional costumes were 
were banned, and I know in the Caribbean it was the same, particularly in Trinidad, some of the early carnivals, there was a lot of issues. I don't know so much if that happened in Danish West Indies, but I know I've read in Trinidad that that was a big deal of putting the masquerading down. Um, you didn't mention it in Africa at all, and I assume that's because that's it was it's a bigger part. It's continuing. I mean, I don't want to bring this up too much, but there's, <laughs> there's been a historic conflict between the church mm -hmm. and masquerades. And that, I don't only apply to the Christian church, but also to the Muslim. Mm -hmm. They don't like artistic representation. They don't like dancing too much, at least not dancing as we record, recognize it. Um, there, masquerades weren't repressed in the Danish West Indies. Rather, they were encouraged. What was repressed was uh, the gombe. You know, there was a whole riot in Christians then. People lost their lives. They called in the soldiers, and as a result, the militia were disbanded. But the difference is that masqueraders, they don't stay in one spot. They move around, therefore they don't get so annoying. But the, the bamboo or the gombe dancers would set up, and probably for two days they'd be drumming and singing and making noise. And, and that upset a lot of people, and as a result, the Gombe and the Bambula, I say, they were pretty much finished. Plus the fact that the songs of the, the Bambula songs always contained a lot of commentary. Sometimes they would praise people, sometimes they criticized people, and that tended to get on people's nerves. And, and then again, the Bambula and the Gombe dancers were very sexually, a lot of waist whining and shaking and, and things like that, which, again, were not appreciated by the elites or the Europeans. <clears throat> masquerades, they tended to encourage masquerades. I've got reports in one or other of the book, books about them encouraging masquerades. You know. um, in Europe, well, they're still continuing, but in those rural areas. But I think with what we might call the New Age and this, that and the other, a lot, a lot of folk are looking into the old traditions and sort of reviving them, which is, is great. There were some strong bears from Germany who visited Whittlesea, where they still have the straw, straw bears, and they, they had German bears and English bears performing together. So there is that kind of revitalization going on. A lot of the repression occurred back in the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, but now we're beginning to see a bit of a revival. Yeah. Any more for any more? Well, thank you again, everybody, and I appreciate you hanging in there. I hope you found it interesting. And if you have a